There is no better way to start a new year than to concentrate on the great name of our God. And that's especially true for somebody like me, because I am not a big fan of the unknown. I like to know what's coming. I like to have a plan for what is coming. I like to have a backup plan for my plan for what's coming. I like to have a contingency plan for my backup plan for the plan of what's coming. Now, I know some of you are not like that. In fact, some of you enjoy adventure. You enjoy not knowing what you're doing. You enjoy being there on the edge, don't know what's going to happen, don't know who you are, don't know where you are. You just love the thrill of it. How many of you are like that? Anybody like that? Okay, there's four of you here. Because right, Okay, there's two more over here. All right, thank you. Three. All right, thank you. The rest of them are outside doing something like that right now to be on the edge. The rest of us are in here going, what's going to happen this year? Anybody like me, you like to have a plan? Anybody like that? Like that plan? You like to know what's going on? Yeah. In fact, you probably got a plan in your back pocket right now, don't you? You're ready to pull that out just in case. You, you, you liked, you liked the, the stop, drop, and roll plan. You liked that, right? I mean, when they did that in school, you were front of the line of that. You love tornado drills. You love fire drills. You love a plan because you don't like the unknown. Well, that, that's where I am. I don't like the unknown. And so it becomes difficult when you look at a new year because when you're at the beginning of a new year, there is a whole lot that is unknown in this next year in there. And at the end of the year, at least this past year, since I had a couple of days off on this vacation, I watched a little more television than what I normally do, and there was a whole lot of emphasis on, we don't know what's going to happen in the world. It's going to be bad. It's going to be scary. And I just kind of had to stop and back away from that and concentrate not on the circumstances or not what's going on, but upon what God's Word says for us and who God is. Because God loves to put his people into settings and circumstances where they are not in control. He loves that. It, well, actually, he loves putting his people in a place where they recognize that they are not in control. Because as much as we want to think that we are in control, we are not in control. So what I try to do, and I'll help the four or five of you who are like me, I went back to the scriptures and I looked for people that God put them into unknown situations and watched what he did for them. And I watched how they responded to him in the midst of those unknown circumstances. And really, when you look at it, God did that to a lot of people time and time and time and time again. But the people, the person that we want to concentrate on today is a guy by the name of Abraham, Really, his name was Abram, but his name was changed. And the story of Abram is found in many different places. But we're going to start off on our journey toward Abraham because I just love the story. Because in Genesis chapter 12, he gets a message from God. And really, when you're following the story, there is really not much said about Abram, Abram at this point. There's not much said about him until chapter 12. Really, you don't find a, a lot of detail about who he was or what he was doing. In chapter 11, you do have his family lineage, and you know who his grandpappy was and all those people. But you don't know anything about Abraham, or again, Abram, his name is changed later to Abraham. But we don't know much about him, and yet in Genesis chapter 12, we hear that God says to him, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, for some of you, you're like, yes. That sounds so cool. But for people like me, that's pretty scary. In fact, I like to know where I am going. In fact, I like that so much that when I leave for a trip, my assistant Amy prints off a map for me and hands to me so that I know where I'm going, even on Monday afternoons. And she'll give that to me so that, she'll, that I'll know how to get back to my house. I love having that. In fact, I love having my phone that lets me know where I'm going. I could turn right or left. Now, I know that Mark Miller is a great preacher. Mark Miller is a great preacher. Mark, where are you? He is a great preacher. You heard him last week, right? Isn't he great? But he cannot find his way out of a paper bag when it comes to directions. <laughs> I love you, brother. But I'm gonna, I'm, you, you had pictures of me one time up on the screen, so let me just get back to you. I'm on a trip with Mark, and when I take a trip with a person and I'm driving, that person's responsible for getting us there. All right, that's their job. We're their directions. And I go with Mark, and we're sitting in Jefferson City, okay? 
Not that big a place. But we're sitting in Jefferson City, and I'm like, we've got to get to this building. And I can see the building from where we're sitting. And I say, Mark, pull out your phone and tell us how to get there. And he pulls out his phone, and it says on his phone that we are one day and eight minutes from our destination. <laughs> Am I lying, Mark? I'm not, that's exactly what it said. And I said, from that moment on, Mark, you're not in charge of getting us where we're going. Because that makes me nervous if it's going to take me a day and eight minutes to get to where I'm going and I can see it, that makes me really, really nervous because I like to know where I'm going. And if you're like me, you like to have a plan. You want to know where you're going. And so for God to speak to us and say to us, hey, I want you to follow me and I'm not going to tell you where you're going. You just start going and when you get there, I'll show you. For many of us, that's scary. It is for me because I like to know. And yet God promised (coughs) that if he did that, that if Abraham would do that, that God would bless him and he would make him a blessing to everybody that was a blessing to him. In fact, he would make him a nation of many, many people. And yet it's got to be very challenging for him to go and to do that. But what's even more scary about that is that Abraham is not 18 years old when he asked him to do this. And see, as you get older, you get more scared about more things. Right? When you're young, you don't know any better. You don't know that the world's a big, bad place and it's scary, so you just take off and you just go. When you get older, you go, wait a minute, this is scary. And we don't know what's going to happen. And the older you get, the more scared that you get of everything in the world. I love my dad. I love my dad, and I'll brag on him in a few moments. But my dad would always say things like, you don't want to go to the city because people get killed in the city, so you shouldn't go to the city. And so I go to San Francisco on our mission trip, and I go, and I come back, and I didn't get killed. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, that, can't, that must be strange. And so I went back again, and I went to San Francisco and came back and didn't get killed. It's just kind of scary to think about that, because the older you get, the more scared you are. Like me, I'm to the age, and I've said this before, that I like watching television shows that I know how they end. I like that. I like watching reruns. I like going to movies when they're reissued. I like to go out to the movie theater and see them. I don't like all this new stuff. It's scary. I don't know how it's going to end. And the older you get, the worse that it gets. For most of us. And do you know how old Abraham was when God called him to go and do this? He wasn't 18. He wasn't 21. He wasn't 25. He wasn't 35. Do you know how old he was? 75 years of age. Now think of your average 75 year old. Do they want to go someplace where they don't know? Now they probably don't know because you can get confused at 75. I know and you don't remember where you were going. That's a totally different thing. Okay. Totally different thing. I'm talking about that. You don't know where you're going. For most of us, at any age, that's a little scary, but at 75, that's even more scary. But Abraham goes and does that, and he has faith to believe, so much so that later on in Genesis chapter 15, the Scripture says that he believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him or credited it to him as righteousness. He believed. And because of his faith, it was counted or credited to him righteousness, meaning it was right, it was good, and that put him in good relationship and allowed him to continue the good relationship because he believed him. And so this morning, what I want to do is for us to look at the passages of Scripture that talk about Abraham, and there are several different places. Genesis is some great information. Hebrews chapter 11, which is the faith, the hall of faith, or the chapter of faith, he is in that. But in Romans chapter 4, I want us to spend the majority of our time. So if you're going to have a Bible open, Romans chapter 4 is probably the place that you want to be, because in this, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's having a disagreement over what makes you righteous with God, what makes you right with God. And the people that he's writing to believe that if you do the right thing, that you're going to be right with God. That if you follow the rules, if you do all the things that you're supposed to do and you don't do all the bad things, then you're going to be right with God. Uh, the Jewish people felt like that their obligation was to meet the, the, what the law said. And so if you did those things, you were good. If you didn't do those things, you were bad. And yet in In chapter 4 of Romans, the Apostle Paul comes and argues against that and says, no, 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 it's not your actions, it's not doing good that makes you right with God, it is your faith. And he begins to talk about the Apostle Paul. In chapter 4, verse 18, it says, in hope he, meaning Abraham, and you can read the whole chapter in the background of this, we don't have time to go through that. I trust you have a Bible, I trust you can read on your own, so I'll encourage you to do that. When we come in verse 18, it says, in hope he, Abraham, believed against hope. 
That's kind of strange. What does it mean to, in hope he believed against hope? Well, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. See, as a part of what Abraham was supposed to do, even though he didn't do it right, even though he didn't get it right most of the time, he was told that if he went and did this, God would make him a blessed person. He would make him a nation that would have many, many people a part of that. And so he goes, he begins to believe that, and verse 19 says that he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Now, let me kind of skip forward in the story. God tells Abraham, if he goes and does all this, that God will honor and bless him, and he'll be a nation that has many people in it. There's only a, a problem with that. And the problem is that Abraham doesn't have any kids of his own. He doesn't have any children. That's not a big deal if God's made a promise to you to bless you through your children and you're 18. That's not a big deal. In fact, that's kind of comforting at that point, right? That you don't have to take care of children. But when you get to about 20 or 25 or 29 or 30 or 40, at some point you begin to wonder, Lord, when is this ever going to happen? And we follow Abraham's life and Abraham has no children up until the age that he is about 100 years old. At the one age you're not wanting children, at 100 years of age, in fact, how many, I were asking the first service, and, and some of you are here in this service, how many of you were glad to see grandkids? Anybody raise your hand and say you're glad to see grandkids? Yeah. How many of you were glad to see grandkids go? Raise your hand on that one. Yeah. See, many people love that. We're thankful for the kids that come. We love to see the taillights when they leave. And your parents, if you brought your children with you and you have little children, they rejoice quietly and secretly as you left because they can go back to their life where it's quiet and nice without everything going on. That's the way that it goes. And so he has living with this problem that he doesn't have any kids, gets to be the age of 100, his wife is about of that same age, and he's about to give up. You would think he would. But the scriptures go on to say that no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Because he believed, he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And that's what I want us to break down here for just a few moments that we've got together. We want to talk about what is that mean? What does that mean for us in our life to believe And what does that mean for us on how we should live? So here's what we want to do. We want to take a look at this this one verse, or verse and a half really. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Now that's really the key to this. I mean, that's that's, that's the key. Giving glory to God is the key to everything. But I'm going to trust that you believe that and know that because I want to kind of give you the rest of this part because I want to focus on verse 21 where it says that he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Now, what's interesting, as I've told you, is that he had to become fully convinced that God was going to do those things. You know the story. I've just told it to you. Abraham's been promised. He doesn't have any kids. Genesis 2, Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis 15, he doesn't always do things right. In fact, he lies about his wife, which is always a wrong thing to do, all right? So he lies about his wife. But then in verse chapter 15, he begins to be worried that he doesn't have any children of his own. So he says, well, I've got some other, I've got some servants. Is that where the faith is going to come from? Is that where it's going to happen? And God says no, and he makes this promise that he's going to have as many kids as there are stars in the sky. That's a pretty big promise, especially when you're 100 years old and you don't have any kids. That's a pretty big promise. That's kind of hard to see. But the scripture says that even though he didn't understand it, that Abraham was fully convinced. Now, that word fully convinced is a very interesting word in the Greek language. It's actually this word, and I don't say it very well, but pleroforeo, okay? I'm from South Arkansas, so it's very hard to pronounce Greek. So it is pleroforeo, and what that is word means, it's actually a compound word made of two different Greek words. Now, you've got to be careful when you think that compound words put together mean certain things, right? That they have a meaning, because if you put butter and fly together, you really wouldn't think of a butterfly, right? I mean, there's no connection to a butter and fly to the animal of a butterfly, so you've got to be careful. But here in this Greek, there are two different words here. Two, two words make up a compound word, and one of the words means to fill up completely. It means like a, a hollow vessel or a cup. And it means to be completely filled up, or it can mean if you've got something that's flat, that it's completely covered. Okay? There's not a space that's empty on that. It's all completely, so it's either completely covered or completely filled up. And the other word here is the word to mean, that means to be worn or to wear, uh, or sometimes it's used to talk about armor. And if you're wearing armor, sometimes they're saying that you're bearing armor. So the concept here for this word is completely covered. 
completely covered, and you kind of wear this wherever you go, that you are just simply fully convinced there's, there's not a piece of doubt, there's not a piece of wondering, there is a complete statement of faith that you are fully persuaded, one translation says, fully convinced. Now, the best illustration I can think of this is when you look at a kid who's on the edge of the swimming pool, small child, and the dad in the swimming pool saying, son or daughter, jump. You've seen this, right? You've probably done this with your own children, right? You're trying to teach them to have faith in you and to jump. I remember that my church did something even worse to me than even that concept. Uh, We went to a small church in Arkansas, and we would get together on the fifth Sundays, and we would have a party after evening church in the fellowship hall. And and the pastor would try to do something innovative and talk and, and creative. And so what he did is he invited me up, and I was probably six or seven. I don't even remember how old I was. But he was going to use me as an example. Does that surprise anybody? He's going to use me as an example. So he uses me an example, and not in a positive way, but he uses me an example. So he brings me here, and he says, here's what we're going to do. And he brings two guys out, the two tallest guys in our church, both guys about six foot six or so. He brings them out, and he brings out this little two-before board. And he said, Neil, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you on that two-before. We want you to put your hands on the heads of these two guys because they're going to lift you up while you're blindfolded. And then your dad's going to say, jump, and we're going to want you to jump. Okay? Now, that's a little scary to think about that, Okay? And this is maybe part of the reason I messed up the way that I am. This kind of had an effect on me, all right, especially in church, all right? You know, shouldn't do things like that in church. Well, so they put the blindfold on me, and they put me right there, those two tallest guys, and I've got, you know, I've got them stretching up, and they've kind of bent down. But what I did not know is that with the blindfold on, instead of lifting me far up in the air, they lifted me a couple of inches, and both those guys at the same time did this and went down. So I've got my hands on the top of those guys' heads, and I know these guys are six foot six, six foot eight, and then they're way down there. I'm having to kind of bend over to to grab their head, but they're just they're just really short because they've just kind of bent down. And my dad, probably the proudest moment in his in his life with me, it was to say, son, jump. And as soon as he said that, I just jumped like that. Just jump with all abandon. I didn't even care because why? That was my dad. Right? Now, if I would not have jumped, who looks bad? Does the kid look bad? Because everybody knows that you should trust your dad. At the swimming pool, have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen a dad trying to convince the kid, it's okay, it's okay, jump, it's okay. And everybody's looking at you like, what's wrong with you that your kid doesn't trust you to jump off in the pool? What's wrong with your kid? They don't blame the kid, do they? They blame there's got to be something wrong with dad. Why is it, what's wrong with dad that he's not doing that? Well, here, God says to us, that he's created the entire universe, and you're worried about something. He says, jump, it's okay, I've got you covered. One way or another, I've got you covered. And most of us are going, "Uh uh-uh, I don't know that I can trust God for that. God's like, what? I just created the entire universe. I created your body. I know how to fix it if it breaks. I can do all of that kind of stuff, and yet you're afraid, and not that God's worried about being made look bad. He doesn't worry about that. But it's as if we're saying, I don't know if I can trust my dad on that. I don't know if I can trust him. And some of you walk around going, I just don't know if I can trust him. I don't know if I can trust God. I don't know if God can cover my problems. And God looks at you and goes, what? You're kidding me, right? You don't think that I can do that? Now, most of us won't do that, but we'll go, well, you know, God, I I trust you, but I'm going to have a backup plan just in case you don't show up. And you know what? That's That's what Abraham did. And did it work out very well for Abraham? No, it didn't. So the challenge for us is to be fully convinced, filled up with convincement, if you will, which is not a word, I know that, but be fully convinced, fully persuaded that our God is what? That he was or is able. Now, now not that he will, but that he is able. See, I I get a little confused sometimes where, where people begin to think that just because God is able that he will. And there's a big difference in that. God has the power, but he may not exercise that power. But if he chooses not to, it is okay. One of my favorite passages of Scripture in the book of Daniel. And, and Daniel's got these friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? I did, a, I did a musical back in the 70s, Cool in the Furnace. Anybody remember that musical? That's a good musical. I love that musical. And so we did that musical. And, and I remember the story of that, that these guys are supposed to bow down to the King Nebuchadnezzar. They don't. They get in trouble, and they get threatened with being thrown into a fiery furnace and being burned up. 
And these guys have the audacity to say to the king, you can look it up in Daniel yourself, to say to the king, king, our God is able to deliver us from this fire. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, we will not bow. Oh, I love that. Because that's not wimpy Christianity. That's not, oh, please, Mother May I. That is an in-your-face king. We don't care what you say. Our God is able to do that. If he doesn't, that's cool too. But he has the power to do that. Do you live like that? See, we have people who think that they can claim on God and they say, God, well, God's able, so he's going to. Well, maybe, maybe not. We don't need to necessarily believe that God's going to deliver us through the physical circumstances, but, we've also, but we must believe that he is able to do that. I was reading a quote this, this past week. Um, John Piper, a big, big pastor for many, many years, he's actually retired now. And so he's no longer pastoring the church. He's been there for 30 years. And so it's kind of a, kind of a shock. They had this, this young punk come in who doesn't know anything, you know, kind of like me. And so he comes in there to this church. And I've been reading about that. And they were asking John Piper, what, what would you say to the next pastor? What would you say to other people who are going through transition, all that kind of stuff? And, and he said this. He said, you must believe that the Lord has many more ropes and ladders and tunnels out of the pits than you can conceive. Wait, pray without ceasing and hope. That struck me because many of us feel like we're in a pit and we've got a plan for God to get us out of the pit. And when that plan doesn't show up, then we begin to panic. Lord, this is the only way that you can do that. And the Lord goes, no, 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 no. I got other ways. I got so many ropes to get you out of pits. I got so many ladders or tunnels. You don't even know. You don't even know what I can do. Why are you so worried? I've got so much ability. And if we will just believe that the next time we're in a pit, we'll be better off. Because in Genesis chapter 15, when, when Abraham talks to God, it says, well, you know, I don't have any kids. I'm about 100 now. I don't have any kids. Is it going to be one of my servants? Is that where the lineage is going to come from? That's got to be the way it's going to work. I don't understand it. God says, no, I'm going to do something that's going to come from you. And then so he goes, well, okay, I understand that. But look at my old wife. Uh, she's not going to be, able to, 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 to be able to have kids. Okay, I get it that I can, but she's the problem. And so what I'll need to do is to borrow another woman to be a surrogate for that, which God does and creates really those, if you want to think about it, that are not following Christianity but are following Islam. That's where they kind of trace their history. Has that gone really well for us? No, it never does. See, Abraham thought that he had to get his own rope to get out, his own ladder. God goes, no, 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 I got others. Just because that one that you think, no, 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 don't worry about that. And so this year, as you get into a pit, and it doesn't seem like the ladder that you want to come come down, don't go making your own ladder. Don't go trying to figure this out. Don't try to, to go around what God wants to do. Because God is able to do what he promised. Now, now here, here's something you got to recognize. Do you know... That Lazarus, whom Jesus himself raised from the dead, ended up dying. Did you know that? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that every person that Jesus healed got sick after they were healed? Just because God is able to do what he wants to do, he's only going to do what he promised, and he never promised that that physical life is going to be what survives for all time. He never promised that. What he has promised is that he will never forget us, that he will never forsake us. Have you ever felt like you were forgotten? That's the way Abraham felt. Abraham was like, Lord, you made all these promises. I left everything. I follow you. I get here. You promise you're going to do this kind of stuff, and you have forgotten me. God says, no, no, no. I haven't forgotten you. I'm going to keep my promise, but I've got a different timetable than, your, than what you think I do. The promise that I'm going to meet something even bigger and better than that. You can look throughout all of scriptures, but there's other passages like in Deuteronomy 31 that says that we're to be strong and courageous and not to fear or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God goes with us and he will not leave us or forsake us. Now, I know that's to Joshua. That's to a certain context, to a certain setting, to a certain particular fo focus. But that's true to us that God's not going to forget us. And so one day when we get sick, it doesn't mean God's forgotten us. Well, one day, if we lose our job, it doesn't mean that God's forgotten us. There are some who believe that if, you're, if God's not blessing you, then you've done something wrong. And that's kind of true. We've all sinned. 
That's for sure. But there's not necessarily a direct relationship because sometimes God has a better healing than the healing that we can get in this world. He can have sometimes a better something for us that transcends this life. It goes into the next life. In fact, at the end of Romans chapter 4, the passage we're studying, when we come to verse 23 or so, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. Here's what Paul's saying. This message to Abraham, he's writing this about Abraham years and years ago. He says the message of that being counted to him as righteousness, that's not just for Abraham. It's not for just Abraham that he believed and he gets credit for it. No, no, it's not for him. It's for us, what? Also. It's for us. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised him from the dead, Jesus our Christ, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Here's the deal. In this world, we're going to run into circumstances and pits and problems that God has the ability to fix or to get us out of, but he may not choose to do that. He may not. But he sent a sure fire ladder, a sure fire rope to get us out of the greatest pit. And the greatest pit has nothing to do with not having a job. The greatest pit has nothing to do with being sick. The greatest bit is our sin that has separated us from God. And so if we are not healed in this life, we will be healed in the next life because Christ has come for us. And if you don't get out of the little circumstance and difficulty you face in 2013 and your world may fall apart, Jesus has not forgotten about you. He has secured your eternity. He has got a place for you that will be with him forever and ever and ever. And in that place, there are no, there's no crying. There's no tears. There's no trouble. There's no difficulty. He has already secured that for you. And so if you and I have to still be in a pit for certain times in here, it's okay. We believe that he is able to do that. And even if he doesn't do that, we're okay with that because we know the God who loves us so much that he sent his own son. So, as we go into 2013, are you fully convinced that he is able to do what is promised? Do do you know his promises? Do do you know what he's promised? Do do you know what those things are? If you don't know what those things are, at least one of them I've told you today is he's never going to leave you or forsake you. Never. And so if you get sick, it's not a lack of faith. If you have an accident, it's not a lack of faith. He is able to solve all of that. He is able, and we must be fully convinced of that. But we also know that he will do what he has promised. And when this life is over, for those of us who have believed, those who have not just intellectually believed, but like Abraham, believed and had the faith to step out on that belief and actually do that, to actually go into a place where he did not know where he's going, when we actually believe that and do that, God counts that to us, credits that to us as righteousness. And even that faith that we have is a gift from him, something that we can't even create on our own. So we're going into the unknown this year. We have no idea what's going to happen. We have no idea. We may think we do, but we don't. And yet we can be fully convinced that he is able to do what he has promised to do. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Now, I don't know where you are. You may be in a pit right now. And you're going, well, that's nice. That's all friendly, happy talk. But there's more to that than just friendly, happy talk. And so maybe today you need to hear that message and be convinced, fully convinced that God is able to do what he's promised to you. Now, you may have to know what he's promised to do. And you may need to check your list against what the Bible says of the promises. But he's able to do that. But even if he does not, he has already gotten us out of the biggest mess we could ever find ourselves in. And that's our own sin that separated us from God forever and ever. And if he's done that for us, what really more could he or should he do? And so today, if you've never repented of your sin, you've never come to the point where you've believed in him to actually step out on faith and trust him, that he is the one and only way to forgive you of your sin, then you can do that today. At the end of this service, I'll be down front. Our prayer partners will be here. Somebody will be happy to talk to you about what that means to make that decision. And maybe you're a believer this year, and you're, you're, you're maybe you're, you're kind of nervous about 2013. 2012 was so great, and so you're kind of worried about it. Don't be worried, but be fully convinced, for with that, you'll be credited righteousness. Father, help us today in our lives to respond to you, not just in this moment, but definitely in this moment. And Father, with our very lives, we would have the confidence to believe that you're able. You may not, and if you don't, that's okay, because you've got a better plan. 
something better for us than, than moving the way that we want you to. You've got a different ladder, a different rope that we weren't expecting. But, but Father, we believe you can. And so help us as it gets dark sometimes this year, as we celebrate great things that happen in our life. Father, whatever it is, may we give glory to you first and have confidence in the blood of Christ, not just for this life, but in the life to come. Father, help us to do that for the benefit of those who live around us, our neighbors, our children, our family, even our enemies, Father. But more than that, would you let us do that for your glory, in whose name we ask these things. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing a song. It's a song of response, a song of reflection. Maybe you need to make a decision. Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Whatever you need to do, would you do that as we stand together?